Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you are. Welcome to this very special discussion on mobilizing climate action as part of the Davos Agenda Week 2021. Now, to achieve a net zero economy by 2050, we really need to be on track by 2030. To be on track means we have to halve emissions by the end of this decade compared to where we have been these last few years. That's almost about 25 gigatons, 25 billion tons or so that needs to be addressed. Governments cannot do this alone. And the impact of COVID on the economy and public finance has really sharpened the challenge. On the one hand, it accelerates the case for private sector engagement and breakthrough partnerships between governments, business, finance and the innovation community. But on the other hand, it shows how we have the great opportunity to shape the economic recovery packages to also be climate smart, to get us on the right track to 2030. So we're at a pivotal moment in history. We know we have to do this by the end of a decade. We know by doing this in 2031, it will be too late. We know that governments have a big role to play and help to set goals, but we know they can't do it alone. So this is what we're gonna be focusing on in this discussion. We have the most incredible panel uh, to talk about these issues and to talk about what is being launched here this evening. And I'm delighted to be here with the COP25 president, Karina Schmidt, the Minister of Environment of Chile, the COP26 president-designate, Alok Sharma, the Executive Secretary of the UNFCCC, the UN climate body, Patricia Espinosa, the two COP champions from Chile, Gustavo Monez, and from the UK, Nigel Topping, these are the people who are mandated by the UNFCCC and the COP host governments to trigger this real economy action at scale and to support the detailed negotiations. And to make it all come alive, we're joined also by two leading business figures, Christian Mumenthaler, the CEO of Swiss Re and the co-chair of the CEO Climate Leaders Alliance, and Gloria Fluxa Tienemann, Vice Chairman and Chief Sustainability Officer of Iberostar Group both of whom I'm delighted to say have been part of the World Economic Forum Young Global Leaders Programme. And to cap it all, we have the person who really does need no introduction, that is the Honourable Al Gore. So it's fair to say that we truly have a dream team with us from across government, the UN, social enterprise, global finance, business community and politics to discuss how to push for mobilising climate action ahead of the so important COP26. So let's find out more about these plans to mobilise breakthrough collaborations through to COP26 and beyond, and what the COP presidencies and champions are launching with us today. If you're watching this session on social media or the website, please do share your reflections under the hashtags, hashtag WEF21, hashtag Davos Agenda, hashtag COP26. And as part of this, the COP26 presidency, the UNFCCC, and the, and the World Economic Forum and the Climate Champions are partnering to launch the Race to Zero Breakthroughs. Okay, so let's jump in. We only have a short amount of time, so we're going to have to run at a fair old clip. So let's keep all our comments focused um, so that we can get everybody in. But to kick us off, I am so delighted to welcome the good friend of the World Economic Forum, Patricia Espinosa, who's the Executive Secretary of the UNFCCC. So, Patricia, we see that more and more governments are committing to net zero by 2050 in their national plans, which is a great achievement and much congratulations to you and your leadership. But you also want to push things further. You want to link these government plans up with the wider business and finance community to create practical projects and accelerate this race to zero by 2030. Is that a correct understanding of the plan? Can you tell us more about why that public-private collaboration is so important? Patricia Espinosa, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. And thank you to the World Economic Forum for giving such a, a, an important uh, focus to climate change. Climate change, really the most important challenge facing humanity, existential challenge. It's not the most important, the most urgent one, because we know we are in this pandemic, in the middle of this pandemic, but it certainly is the one that uh, is uh, threatening um, the uh, life in, the, in our planet into the future. 
Um, and, and I'm very, very pleased to join this fantastic group of personalities and leaders um, in helping launch this breakthroughs event. As you rightly say, Dominique, yes, um, collaboration, participation, full engagement of non-party stakeholders, as we call them in our process, but in a very significant way, uh, private sector is absolutely crucial. Go, as you rightly say, governments alone cannot do the deep transformation that is required for us to go further into a reality and a, a future uh, with a low carbon. So, um, of course, 2020 was a very challenging year for everyone. And the, the Race to Zero Dialogues demonstrated, however, how entire sectors are already rapidly transitioning to a zero carbon future. So I'm very happy to be able to join today uh, this uh, launching of the breakthroughs. Uh, the race to zero uh, story continues and it continues uh, to be strengthened with additional participant, participants in uh, these commitments. And uh, that's very much welcomed. Why? Because of course the climate challenges remain daunting. Uh, the reach that the campaign has had is really incredible. The numbers are grown, including almost 1,400 companies and hundreds of cities and universities worldwide. The power and influence of this alliance of cities, regions, businesses, investors, and educational institutions those who have committed to setting targets and taking sustained climate action is remarkable. This is the largest ever alliance dedicated to achieving net zero emissions by 2050. And it serves as a model for all countries as they develop and implement enhanced national climate action plans. And I believe it sends really the strongest possible signal that climate action is needed and is possible now. And this is vital because we no longer have the luxury of time. Each day, each month and year that we delay implementing the Paris Agreement, we risk ceding our world to the consequences of climate change. So we must get back on track. And uh, in this race to zero, really, if we are to succeed, we must raise climate ambition and climate action to levels that have been unachieved until now. So we, I really call on everyone, and I thank the WEF for the leadership in bringing together uh, not only uh, governments, but also uh, business leaders and uh, helping us uh, of course, not only uh, the UNFCCC, but also the presidencies to expand this effort that really needs to reach all corners uh, of the world and all areas of societies. Over to you, Dominique. Thank you. Patricia Espinosa, Executive Secretary for the UNFCCC, thank you so much. So that's fascinating that um, in the world that we live in today, the mobilization of how you turn them non-state actors, businesses, cities, investors, civil society and others are being mobilized to help those government plans come alive, to bring innovation and expertise and financing and new ideas to solve the climate challenge. Minister Schmidt, as COP president for Chile for COP25, um, how does that sound? Does the need to link government plans to this real economy breakthrough resonate with your experience in Chile and elsewhere. Uh, at the launch of the Mission Possible Partnership yesterday, it was fascinating because you were explaining how important it was to engage government with business leaders to show the economic opportunities of the race to a net zero economy. Um, perhaps you could tell us more. But well, thank, thank you all. It's very nice to be together today, you know, in this big challenge that we have to face together. First of all, I want to say that Global warming is a fight that we have to fight in two equal, urgent fronts. First is mitigation by decarbonizing our economies, but adaptation, reducing the vulnerability of our communities, our territories, our infrastructure is also key. And both mitigation and adaptation are fully related. Today, thanks to the science, we have one universal target, net zero 
um, resilient world by 2050 at the latest. To reach this goal, in September 2019, Chile launched, together with the UNFCCC and the UNDP, the Climate Ambition Alliance for Carbon Neutrality and Resilience on 2050, bringing together for the first time states and non-state actors, business and investors, committed to reach net zero emission by 2050 of the latest, understanding that only working together with the private sector, we can foster the ambition loop to tackle the climate ambition to the level that we need. I want to be very clear in this. The private sector is not a problem of climate change. Climate, the private sector is part of the big solution to climate change. Bold government policies with the private sector innovation capacity, seeing an opportunity in a net zero economy, reinforcing each other and building a common path to a carbon neutrality and climate resilient is key. There is no company whose business model won't be profoundly affected by the transition to a net zero economy. Innovation is key. The sectorial breakthroughs being launched today are a concrete expression of the actions required to accelerate the transition towards a net zero and resilient world, as well as a powerful expression of the capacity to help activate the ambition loop that we need at the country level. Some sectors like electricity can evade emissions easily and are already in a good trump, but other sectors like aviation, shipping, tracking, steel, cement, face bigger challenges with reducing CO2 emissions because direct electrification is technically not viable or too expensive. Green hydrogen is a solution for those hard to abate sectors. This is why in 2020, the high level champions of Chile and UK with seven leading companies launched the Green Hydrogen and Catapult Initiative to deploy 25 uh, gigawatts of green hydrogen by 2026, a sign of confidence in the supply base ability to scale up and reduce costs in the short term showing that working together, really, we can make this much faster than we thought. Today, despite, despite the difficult times we are facing with the COVID-19, net zero commitments have doubled during the global pandemic. And in some sectors, they have grown almost exponentially. This demonstrates clearly that companies, cities, states, regions, and investors across the world understand the challenges of climate change and also the business opportunities that are behind climate change. Governments of all over the world must understand that presenting ambitions and DCs contribution is not an unnecessary distraction from the COVID pandemic. On the contrary, ambitious climate action and mitigations and adaptation is the means to recover our economies after this pandemic. To be on track, NDCs can be the blueprints for unlocking investment, support job creation, expand green sectors, and help us build towards a healthy, resilient economy that we need for our planet. Climate change is the most severe challenge that humanity is facing this century. Fighting it urgently is a global ethical imperative. Working together is the only way we can win this race. Understanding that we can create value facing global change, global climate change, is, you know, one of the most important things that we must do. Thank you. Minister Schmidt, thank you so much for that. This is fascinating, isn't it? I mean, for many who've been watching um, the kind of climate discussions over the years, we seem to be entering a new chapter uh, of mobilization at scale of a sprint to 2030 of finance, of business, of innovation, working with government to create those breakthrough collaborations that we need. Uh, we've been involved in the Mission Possible Partnership, as I mentioned, which tackles some of those sectors that you were mentioning. But across the economy, all kinds of collaborations are needed. Alok Sharma, president of COP26 in Glasgow in November. Uh, this sounds all very exciting. Um, you talked about having a new kind of COP. 
involving partnership and action between government and business. Tell us about the, that vision and how this race to zero might turn that vision into a reality and your hopes and ambitions for COP come November. Alok Sharma. Great, thank you, Dominic, and uh, good evening, everyone from Addis uh, Ababa. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to join you and to be sharing this panel with uh, uh, some real champions for uh, uh, global climate action. And so happy to be here as part of this uh, this event. Uh, and uh, you know, the, I think the momentum uh, behind zero emissions is building. Uh, we've seen in the last year uh, countries coming forward with their net zero commitments. Uh, and of course, I welcome what uh, the new uh, US administration has said in terms of action on, uh, on climate change. Uh, and of course, I think as Carolina remarked, last year we also saw net zero commitments from business and local government double. Uh, and the race to zero membership increased to almost 1,400 companies, many of them very large companies, global companies. Uh, and that, of course, is in the midst of this global pandemic. But we know the reason for doing this is because such action is absolutely vital. Uh, and reaching net zero is essential if we are to meet the aims of the Paris Agreement and limit global temperature rises. And we all know that the science on the catastrophic consequences are clear if we do not. We've seen around the world increasingly extreme temperatures, rising sea levels, droughts, floods, other events, and of course, the resulting devastation on people and nature. But the progress that we are seeing to avert this crisis with these commitments to net zero is of course very welcome. And I wanna thank everyone uh, who has set out net zero targets. But we know that to achieve a net zero global economy, actually every single sector in business must play their part. And that requires us to cooperate even more than before and to coordinate our effort sector by sector. Uh, and we need to get each sector to a tipping point. And we must reach a critical mass where the transition to clean ways of working takes off and develops a momentum of its own and then rapidly becomes the norm. And that is why enhancing international collaboration is one of my key priorities as COP26 president. Uh, and it is why I'm absolutely delighted that, that we, alongside uh, our brilliant high-level champions, Nigel Topping and Gonzalo Munoz, are launching the Race to Zero Breakthroughs today. Uh, they're both doing extraordinary work, and I absolutely applaud them uh, for that. And the campaign shows that more than 20 major sectors, uh, exactly how, precisely how, they can get to their tipping point, uh, how they can reach that tipping point, and, and when they need to do so. And whether that is the power sector delivering 60% of renewable energy by 2030, or a fifth of top asset managers committing to align their portfolios with the Paris Agreement within the next five years. Now, these are rigorously researched targets. They're developed with sectoral experts, uh, with business, with governments and civil society. We can all unite around these targets. Uh, and of course, each of these groups has a crucial role to play. And we whether that is developing policy to encourage the change or galvanizing public support for action or committing their business to leading the way. And I urge all leaders across society, but particularly within the business community, to commit to taking action and taking that action now and reaching these breakthroughs as soon as possible. Because, and I think this is the good news, because if every sector plays its part and passes that tipping point within the next decade, we will see the global economy accelerate towards net zero by 2050, and thereby, of course, helping to make the Paris Agreement a reality and forging what we all want to see, a clean and prosperous future for our planet. We can do it. Let's go for it. Thank you. Thank you, Alok Sharma, and thank you so much for joining us from Addis Ababa. You're already on your tours around the key countries of the world to drum up the support for COP26. So this sounds like an exciting breakthrough. We're hearing about a, a campaign, an initiative to open up the Climate COP agenda, to push more on these 20 key sectoral areas for real action, something that many, I would imagine, would, would be supportive if they're listening in. So perhaps there's a chance now to get a little bit more detail uh, from the two COP champions who are helping the governments and the UNFCCC to do this. Um, Gonzalo Munez, Nigel Topping, welcome to you. Um, and we'd love to hear a little bit more about how this is all going to work and what your plan is. 
Uh, I understand you also have a diagram that you'll be showing everyone, um, if that can be put on the screen for our viewers. But uh, Gonzalo Munez, over to you. Thanks so much, Dominique, and of course, thanks to both co-presidents and uh, our dear Executive Secretary, Patricia Spinoza. Myself and Nigel have this honor of being the UN High-Level Climate Action Champions, and, and mostly to connect the work of governments with the work of the so-called non-state actors. Our role is, as I said, quite literally to champion the ambition and action taken by these non-state actors, including, of course, companies, cities, states, regions, investors, addressing climate change, and to connect these to the government ambition and action. Already we have worked with our partners to assemble the greatest ever credible net zero alliance under the Race to Zero campaign as part of the Climate Ambition Alliance, and it was properly highlighted by both uh, Minister Schmidt and, and, and by the president-designate Alok Sharma. But in order to win this race, the world must achieve near-term breakthroughs across every sector of the global economy. Crucially, we have been working with the Marrakesh Partnership, this global alliance of more than 320 major initiatives and coalition, to launch the Climate Action Pathways last November. This set out the near and long-term milestone to achieve net zero, and in doing so, limit the global temperate rise to 1.5 degrees in key sectors of the global economy, absolutely in line with the Paris Agreement. Today, therefore, we have a plan for a coordinated approach from different players across all the economic system that will ensure that we are on track to achieving these pathways. So my dear friend and fellow champion Nigel will now set out this plan. Nigel, for is yours. Great. Thank you, Gonzalo. Maybe if we could have the, the diagram up, um, Dominic, so just explain um, a little bit of what, how, what we're defining as a breakthrough. Um, so, um, so just that the... the the chart with that S curve on it, please. There you go. So what we're trying to do now is go from these pathways, which we've worked on with so many partners, including, as you, as you mentioned, um, Dominic, all the partners in the, in the Mission Possible platform, um, and to find some key milestones and key tipping points that will let us know whether we're on track or not. The first one um, we're calling the Breakthrough Ambition. Um, and that's when we define as 20% of the key actors are in the race to zero. So we know that for that sector, there's a real critical mass of, of momentum building up. And it's not a question of if, but when and how. Um, and then the second we're defining as a breakthrough outcome. And the real emphasis there is on short-term action. What have we got to achieve by the middle of this decade to be on track? Um, and we show that on an S-curve there, because that's the way that we know industrial transformation has always and will always happen. It takes a long time to start. Then as the, as the learning effect kicks in, as the volumes go up, the costs come down, uh, market adoption um, uh, picks up in that, in that rapidly accelerating. We're seeing it now with um, um, electric vehicles. Um, you know, I remember even five years ago, people were thinking we'd still be um, manufacturing electric vehicles in the 2070s. And as you all know, the UK um, a few months ago announced 2030 as the end of combustion engine sales for cars. And today I've just heard that General Motors says 2035. So that's the kind of shape of the curve. And what we're aiming to do for every sector of the economy is to reach that breakthrough ambition in the next couple of years. So by the time of the UN's um, climate stock take in 2023, have every sector past that point. And then we're only focusing on reaching that breakthrough outcome. We're looking forward to meeting leaders from all sectors of society who are working on those breakthrough outcomes in Glasgow um, and having that be the real focus of attention in the action zone, which Gonzalo and I will be convening along with the presidencies. Um, we know now that the transition is inevitable. We know it will occur through exponential change, um, and we welcome everybody to join us in the race to zero and to realize that if you don't join the race this year, you're choosing to be left behind. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Gonzalo and Nigel. If I could just ask a quick question to both of you. Um, if I'm a business or an innovator or an entrepreneur listening to this, what do I do? How do I get involved? How do I find out which a breakthrough area to jump into, uh, or how can I help? If you, if you just search for Race to Zero, you'll find the website. We'll be putting all the breakthroughs up there today. Um, and over the, the weeks and months ahead, there'll be more and more detailed signposting to all of the different initiatives in each sector, whether on the supply side or the demand side, or what um, investors and cities are doing, so that everybody can play their part in their sector, given their, their, their role to drive towards that breakthrough outcome. 
Fantastic. And, and, and in the same in the same web page, you'll find also how to join Race to Zero through the different uh, coalitions and initiatives that are wor working with us. It's all about partnership and radical collaboration. All of those partnerships are there in the same web page. Join, in, in, independent on which sector are you representing, you you have a place here. Fantastic. So the systems change tipping point concept came across really clearly in that uh, diagram to get 20% involved in a breakthrough from a key sector, and it might just tip the rest. Um, so let's test this out then. We've got some uh, leading business figures uh, with us. Uh, uh, Gloria, let's start with you. You've been doing incredible things at Iberostar Group on climate and environmental action. So I guess the invitation to mobilize in partnership with others and with governments to show practical tipping point breakthroughs is, is music to your ears. Um, how could you and the wider travel tourism industry and its value chains get involved, do you think? And what are the sorts of uh, reactions that you have to this, uh, this plan for mobilization for action on the route to COP26? Gloria, over to you. Thank you, Dominic. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and share with you the journey of Iberostar, especially as a recognition to the effort of our family of employees that despite the challenging times, they are helping us fast track our ambitious net zero race. Uh, the tourism industry, as you all know, is undergoing a profound change and crisis. In this context we're in, it is understandable that many believe it's not the time to focus on the environment. We know that the priority of the industry or our tourism industry is to recover activity, but it needs to bounce back better, reinforced and more resilient, so that it is better prepared for future adversities. We like to call it the quest for a responsible tourism model. In Iberostar, that quest has been part of our DNA throughout our history. We launched our own strategic goals until 2030, before the pandemic, with the intention to give guidance to the organization. We're a family business from an island in the Mediterranean with 80% of our hotels next to the ocean. This is why we're motivated by our commitment to the oceans for our wave of change movement, which is based on three pillars, circularity, responsible seafood, and coastal health. In these goals, we have committed to sending no waste to landfill by 2025. We are committed to having all ecosystems and improving ecological health alongside profitable tourism. And last but not least, we committed to reach carbon neutrality by 2030, who brings us here today. In COP25, we became signatories of the 1.5 degrees business for action. Our carbon neutrality plan until 2030 is centered in an internal roadmap that marks two segments, the reduction of our footprint and the compensation or offsetting. So we have planned to reduce the energy we consume by at least 35% by 2030. If the COVID situation improves soon, we will be pushing that figure up to 50%. We are doing so by implementing improved systems of control and monitoring of our energy, and we're actively revising our processes and services to reduce our consumption. Another important factor to achieve this ambition is the training of our people. We never forget our people. In this effort to reduce, a lot of direct cost savings will be generated. So the key here is to use those wisely in investments that will endure and allow us to achieve our goal in the long term, like better infrastructures in the hotels that generate a better return in energy use in the long run. From a business perspective, we do see a return in the long term. We're also looking to source for more renewable options available in our destinations. We try to accomplish this by improving the way we contract energy creating an internal policy for our owned and managed properties to source the maximal amount of renewable energy available from their local providers, but also working to establish our own purchase agreements based only on renewable energy. Of course, this will decrease the carbon footprint even further from the target that I just mentioned before. However, being practical in our approach, since the major part of what we can do without intending to undermine this effort this requires is increased efficiency and source renewables, we need to take a practical and action-oriented approach. For that reason, Iberostar is preparing to still have a footprint by 2030. It's realistic. And that's why last year we launched our strategy to offset at least 75% of our remaining carbon footprint by protecting and restoring nature in our destinations. Why offset carbon emissions abroad when there's so much nature that is in need of protection in our own destinations where we operate? That way, we work towards increasing the resilience of our destinations for crisis to come and involve the communities and countries that have helped us develop our operations, exchanging learnings and empowering all to take action. 
we know that a transition to net zero will not be possible without a massive collective action across the sector, as it has been mentioned today. There's only so much that we can do as an individual business. We need as much leadership as possible to fast track climate action now more than ever. Iberostar wants to be part of that fast track. And that is the reason why we're actively collaborating with other stakeholders and businesses to create guidance for the sector and an exchange of best practices. My sister and I have specifically collaborated to create roadmaps for the sector as co-chairs of the WEF, Global Futures Council Sustainable Tourism Group, the High Level Panel for Sustainable Ocean Tourism Action Coalition, and the WTTC Sustainability Task Force. In conclusion, overall, this race to zero brings many positive benefits to the table. It gives us satisfaction on an institutional and personal level that we're doing what feels right, what is close to our convictions. It increased the knowledge and control of our organization, which will surely help us be more efficient and more effectively adapt to the challenging times. It enriched the training of our people, motivating them towards new types of skill sets. And last but not least, it gave the organization a very strong purpose. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gloria Tiananmen, the Vice Chairman and Chief Sustainability Officer of Iberostar Group. Uh, COP presidents, uh, COP champions, Executive Secretary, I think you have a recruit uh, there from Iberostar. Fantastic work. <laughs> um, if we can turn to Christian Mumenthaler, you're the CEO of Swiss Re. So this is quite a different sector of the economy. You're also the co-chair of the Alliance of CEO Climate Leaders. And I know that you're advocating exactly such specific sectorial tipping point kind of mobilizations. Uh, how can you, uh, with Swiss Re and with this alliance which you co-chair of CEOs, how can you work with the sort of uh, uh, mobilization campaign that you're hearing from, from our friends and colleagues in the uh, governmental uh, community? Christian, over to you. Thank you, Dominique, and thank you for having me here. It's uh, very encouraging what I'm hearing this year, having been involved in climate for about 10 years. This is clearly a year where I see much more focus on uh, on execution. So it's it's very encouraging. I'd say I'd go at the problem from two ends. I think if you look at the, the business community, the first one is the, the shareholder side. So Swiss Re and many insurers and pension funds are big asset owners. And so there's the Asset Owner Alliance, which is UN-led, the Net Zero Asset Owner Alliance. And uh, this five billion, uh, five trillion, sorry, five trillion dollars of assets where the companies have pledged to be net zero by 2050. So that's huge. That means their portfolio, they will measure the carbon footprint of every asset. And on a, on a path until 2050, they have to be zero, which means that companies that are not on that path will be divested, basically. And uh, they have attracted a lot of additional assets. They tried to double that. So that's very powerful because it takes away one of the key uh, excuses many CEOs have or think they have by saying my shareholders don't want that, these investments, et cetera, they don't want that. And it's not true. I think we can see a, a huge wave now uh, coming the business way, which increases pressure very significantly on, on business everywhere. And then there's the business community itself. And I think the way uh, to go about this issue there is that you have more and more people uh, commit to net zero and the brilliance uh, of the definition of net zero means you, it goes through all scopes. So uh, the, the work we've been doing in the Alliance of CEO Climate Leaders, which has been done by, by BCG and published, by the way, brilliant work, shows that for many companies which have high margins and deliver products to the consumer, once they go and make the pledge and analyze where it's coming from, they will find out 80% of their footprint is not within their walls. It's upstream. It's from their suppliers. And these suppliers are typically uh, from hard to abate sectors where it's, it's very difficult on their own uh, to go about it, like cement and steel and uh, transportations. So if these, let's say, richer companies producing uh, goods for consumers, if they want to get to zero, they will have to help invest, uh, you know, encourage uh, the others in, in the harder to abate sectors. And, and they have the means. Because the interesting uh, thing that came from this BCG work is once you look how much these additional costs to be net zero mean for the product itself, it's actually not a lot. So it's like $1 for jeans, it's $500 for a car, $5,000 for uh, a house. So it's like 
2% additional costs for the consumer if everything was net zero. So something that looks impossible for a steel maker or for a transportation firm, once you look at it end to end, is absolutely feasible and financiable. Uh, and therefore, uh, in this alliance of uh, Zero Climate Leads, we have decided to start to look across the value chain, not just in our own sector, because a lot of people are already grouped in their sector, but look at it end to end and see what opportunities we have to encourage uh, those who have the, the hardest tasks and maybe invest and, and commit to uh, you know, certain amounts of uh, what we would take from them uh, to also switch. So as, if you want this, this starting points in the business community and through the value chain, it should spread to the others. And I, I, the tipping point that uh, Nigel talked about is when there's enough of those to actually get the whole system rolling because these uh, you know, up, upstream suppliers, they will have to ask their uh, suppliers to, to move to, to net zero. So uh, I think that's, that's really thanks to the brilliance of this definition, this holistic definition of, of net zero. So I'm, I'm highly encouraged. We had a session today with uh, 47 CEOs of this alliance. They are all pumped up. They, they are keen to show how much they're doing, actually. The, the first, the next five years, I think you see a lot of things being done. To be fair, it's the easier part of it. But I think uh, we're going to have uh, interesting figures to communicate for COP26. Christian, thank you so much. Um, now, it's an absolute pleasure to uh, introduce uh, the Honorable Al Gore. Um, uh, so I don't know if you feel like, um, you know, you've been at this for so long and sometimes it must have felt a slightly lonely journey, whether you're kind of welcome to the party or whether you do sense that there's a tipping point already underway, given some of the conversations that we're having in this discussion between the governmental, the intergovernmental processes and leading business figures. Um, be, be so interested to see your thoughts and reflections on this, given the broader sweep of history that uh, you've shaped um, in uh, driving us all to realize about the climate crisis and how quickly we need to act. Sir, over to you. Well, thank you very much, Dominic, and thank you for what uh, you are doing and Klaus Schwab and the World Economic Forum. And I I've seen a lot over the years. I remember when Patricia Espinosa rescued the entire process in Cancun when she was Minister of the Environment in, in Mexico years ago. Uh, I'm so grateful to Maria, Maria Carolina uh, and Alec, uh, you, you get the baton on the handoff now, and uh, we're, I'm so uh, impressed with your commitment uh, and the business leaders, uh, Christian and Gloria, and our climate champions, uh, Gonzalo and Nigel. Thank you so much. There, I had the privilege of knowing an economist uh, years ago, Rudy Dornbush, who has a law named after him. He's and the law, Dornbush's law says, things take longer to happen than you think they will and then they happen much faster than you thought they could. We are now uh, in the second phase of Dornbush's law. Nigel referred to Mary Ibarra's announcement just two hours ago, General Motors, the largest auto manufacturer in the US, will no longer make petrol or diesel cars as of 2035. We, saw, we heard from the International Energy Agency uh, just in their annual report, solar is the new king in their phrase of energy markets providing the cheapest electricity in the history of the world, along with wind. We're seeing a sustainability revolution that is picking up speed. We see just yesterday in the United States, President Biden announcing major new initiatives. And April 22nd, uh, when he uh, convenes a global summit, you will see the new NDC from the United States. And I believe you will be impressed with it. Uh, we have seen the appointment of not only an A team, but an A plus team in the United States. And we're seeing commitments not only from the US, but China and Japan and South Korea and the EU, which has helped to lead this process. So in closing, I would say we need three things. We need near term targets as well as long term targets. We need a whole system approach. And that is why this uh, a uh, breakthrough document is so uh, helpful uh, to incorporate uh, supply and demand and policy and finance and civil society. And finally, we need to act quickly. We've been reminded by the pandemic that when the leading scientists uh, tell us with greater urgency we have to act, we should listen to them. We should listen to the climate scientists. Uh, final point, by the time, Alec, uh, of uh, the Glasgow Summit, 
uh, uh, COP, we will have accurate measurements and full transparency from the Climate Trace Program for the source and magnitude of every significant greenhouse gas emissions all over the planet. It's up to us to act, uh, and I'm very encouraged and excited by all of the momentum that you all are providing to this challenge facing humanity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Honorable Al Gore. Um, and if you haven't checked it out, check out the Climate Trace Project. It is absolutely fantastically exciting to see how the science will create a transparency revolution around the sustainability revolution to tackle climate change. So that brings us to the end of this special launch session. If you haven't got the message, what have you been listening to? Uh, the breakthrough uh, 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 commitments, the race to zero, the S-curve, the mobilization of business leadership, the links to governments, the need to act in the short run to 2030, not just to set that commitment to 2050, Glasgow in November in the UK as the key stopping off forum to show where the world is at. Um, it's been a delight to have you all for this discussion. I hope you've enjoyed it um, as you've been listening in. Uh, the World Economic Forum, of course, is honoured to be invited to support this multi-stakeholder effort on behalf of the COP through to November and beyond. And we look forward to our special annual meeting in Singapore in May as a key milestone to assess progress on the race to zero across these breakthrough areas. So thank you, Alok Sharma, and all that you're doing, Team UK, uh, to drive home uh, this uh, breakthrough and this race to zero. Thank you to all our speakers for your tremendous vision and leadership. It's truly gonna be an exciting year for climate action.